Hello, fellow travelers. Here we are, Fate's Wide Wheel. And this week, I am super excited to bring back to the show Derek Hughes and Benjamin Rabb. I uh, am thrilled to talk about the episode One Night in Koreatown. Uh, really looking forward to it. There's a lot of great stuff and great ground to cover. Um, Derek, welcome back to the show. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having us. We're really excited to be here on this Sunday. I don't know what day it is anymore. <laughs> we happy to be here. How about it? Like... That works. That works. Yeah, it is Sunday, October 29th, 3 o'clock Chicago time. So that means it's 1 o'clock your guys' time, uh, which is a little funny that story. That sounds about right. Moment. <laughs> ben, how are you? I'm great. I was just in Chicago last weekend fantastic oh that's right yes i I, you have a you have a family connection if you will (laughs) in the area my my, my daughter's at columbia college chicago very excited super cool super super cool um well i am like i said i'm thrilled to talk about the episode Uh, before we get in there though to talk about it uh, i i talked a little bit about this with romy and didn't really have the chance as much to talk about it with christy I, you know, with the strike being over now, I I would love to kind of get some of your thoughts on, you know, what you what you did uh, with the time and, you know, how you're feeling now that things are uh, resolved and and you're back working on the show again. Uh, Ben, I'll go ahead and start with you. Um, I mean, well, I personally, I'd rather defer to our our WGA board member who's present, but I will I will say from my experience um, that uh, I'm very proud of our union. I'm very proud of what uh, everyone stood and fought for and walked and fought for. And rallied and fought for, uh, and and the results that the uh, the negotiating committee managed to to, uh, to to get out of this um, for everyone, for the future of our union, for the future of our profession. I think it was all pretty pretty amazing. Um, missed the show while we were not, you know, while we were walking the line, um, but we did walk outside the, the the gates of our offices at the Universal Barroom. That was, you know, our, our sort of our walking ground. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, we missed our cast, we missed our crew, we missed, you know, this being able to continue to make the show we love. And I'm very happy that we are back to doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Derek, as Ben mentioned, uh, you know, being a, a member, uh, uh, director of WGA, uh, uh, pardon me, I'm, I'm flubbing my lines here. Uh, what, what is your title uh, on the board? And, well, and uh, I'm, a, can you I'm, talk a, about I'm, a, I'm on the board of directors for the WGA. So I'm on the board. It's a, it comprised of 16 members and uh, and officers and incredible staff. And yeah, I've been on there. This is my third term. Um, and then this was the most important term and most important time of our, of our careers uh, for ourselves and for all writers. And that's why we're out there for 148 days walking the pavement, trying to make sure that we have not only just a fair contract, a good contract, but a sustaining contract that will, you know, get, will extend the our, our livelihoods beyond just today and tomorrow. And it's very important for people to understand that this was not a, a small feat. This was not anything that we took lightly. It was very much an existential, you know, crossroads that we were all facing, where it was the future of the Writers Guild and future of the career of writers in general. Um, and just Hollywood in itself, we had to save Hollywood from Hollywood. And that's what the actors are doing. That's what the actors have been doing now for the past 105 plus days of trying to get their own fair contract and and fighting against, you know, uh, unfortunately, there are, you know, there's a belief and an attitude that that has sort of um, that we've been battling, which is basically that we're, you know, all nothing but greedy writers and, you know, like rich millionaires. And it could be further from the truth. We are, a lot of us are just nine to five, you know, working and we're just working in a different profession, but it's still trying to make ends meet, trying to, you know, provide for your family, provide for your relatives, yourself, you know, whatever. And, and I, you know, just to, um, to do what you love, but, it was it it's been it was a it was a battle and we came you know we came out victorious we came out triumphant we came out in a way that made people realize that we are essential to this to this business and i think that's what the actors are doing now you know the same way is like they are taking a stand because there are some people and some entities that believe that we don't matter and that you know that everything can be solved with a push of a button and, and that's, you know, that's like, so I, I'm very proud of our union. I'm very proud of the members and and everybody that supported us and including, uh, our, you know, crew, uh, crew, the IOTC Teamsters, you know, they stood by our side because we're all in this together in a way that is like, it's so, you know, when they have 
it's time for their con- uh, contract negotiations come next year and the year after. It's very much uh, also they're going to have to take a fight because unfortunately they're in such a a sort of um, a tremendous amount of greed on display across the country that we have seen where, you know, a handful of people, you know, feel like that they should own everything and everybody else should just take nothing, <laughs> you know? So that's, that's in itself. Yeah. And I would say, but there are other, there, you know, there are other uh, cooler heads prevailed and, and people finally, you know, stepped up and realized that we all are in this together because it's a collaborative medium. It's like in order to make the shows and the movies that you enjoy, it takes a village. It really does. And it's like, while it may start on the page, it doesn't end on the page. You know, <laughs> it's like, that's the thing you have to, you know, take into consideration. Right. And, and I think that, you know, it's finally getting people to, you know, realize that and hopefully, you know, uh, um, set some, you know, put right what once went wrong as we're, you know, kind of doing. So Absolutely. On the, I'll, I'll segue into that in that way, in that fashion. But I will say also just very happy that it's, it's, it's over for us. Um, I'm still out there. I try to get up there as, uh, you know, at least an hour or so in the morning to walk with the, uh, with the actors in the morning before we start work. So I'm fortunate to do that. Um, but yeah. it's in fingers crossed that they too will come out of this with a, a really great deal. Um, sooner rather than later, because we still want to make more shows. <laughs> we still want to make more episodes. And so, that's, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, you know, um, yeah, that's what we've been, been doing. It's, and so coming back into this, it's it's been fun. It's great, to get, you know, come back with all the rest of the writing staff, you know, reunite with Martin and Dean, uh, and 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 you know, just dive right back into this because we still have five more episodes that we had to we have to crack and figure out. So even yeah. right now, you know, we're doing that. Right, right. Um, well, I, I, first of all, I really really appreciate that, and 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 adding further context to everything because you know certainly I've tried in my small way parsing through, you know, different things that I've read and, and heard and watched and, and seen what's going on to communicate some of that with the listeners, and and it's been something that there you know amongst the fandom, and and obviously there's so much crossover between you know the Quantum Leap fandom and and so many others. There's been a lot of interest, and there's been luckily a lot of support, and so there've been conversations between fans who aren't you know working in film and television but still interested and and passionate about it and so to be able to have that added context i think is really beneficial and i know one of the things that i've certainly said on a couple of occasions is like this this sort of existential threat a lot of it seems to stem from the fact in, in in my belief and i'd love to hear your response to this that so many of the people that seem to be you know controlling that um uh, you know the 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 dollar basically uh and, and you know what gets made they come from these business backgrounds you know they come from these backgrounds that have very little to do with art and, and entertainment and that's such a shift from the way things had been you know 50 60 70 years ago in in hollywood when and when a lot of those people that controlled those studios they wanted to make movies you know they wanted to make tv they were artists as well as being businessmen and i think today that 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 has shifted a great deal and and i'd love to kind of hear a little bit of your perspective on that yeah, I won't get too much into it, but I definitely feel you're absolutely right. But I wouldn't even say 50, 60 years ago. I'd say even just like uh, the last strike, the last time that we, the Writers Guild went on strike, which was back in 2007, 2008, there were still people that were in charge that actually came up through the business, that worked in the business, that understood the business and understood the importance of how to maintain this business, even though they were fighting on that side because they were basically labor. Um, but yeah, it's like so when the you know the the uh, idea i mean the the uh, when it came finally to a place of like where it it realized that so much pain is being inflicted so much loss is being there's you know there's people that were able to step in and saying like you're destroying this town you're destroying this business because they understood how it works but like you said there's a lot of people that come in from it from the tech sector that come in from businesses that you know that have never been involved in and in, and in even come up through the system in the in working in in the entertainment uh industry it has a different outlook and a different uh pov of and uh an attitude unfortunately that sometimes works against you uh and then, then there's other people that actually want to really be still be a part of it and you know want to learn about it but it's still an educational process and i think that that yeah there's something has been lost in that way where it's become so much of the commerce is you know, the, the all driving force and not so much 
art, right? Yeah, um, right. And that's I think indicative and in, you know the sort of across you know across our country and our society in that way, where so much focus is more so on that, and you know, and and so that's where as we as as creatives you know we we still you know we're still trying to survive and still trying to be creative as possible in this and you have to adapt in this way you know and and i said you know bring yeah. it back to the show being on the show has been such a uh a a treat and and so you know so grateful to be able to be creative in, in ways that you know you 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 normally sometimes forget that you uh, get to do this <laughs> so, you know, it yeah. is like over 148 days when we're, when you're walking though, you definitely miss it, <laughs> you know, and you just want to get back <laughs> you know, and appreciate yeah. it. So, yeah. Well, I appreciate you both. I appreciate your work. I appreciate your work, Derek, you know, on the board of directors. I appreciate, you know, seeing the photos that both of you share being out on the picket lines. And, you know, uh, I, I saw, I, I think a little more uh, from Ben on Twitter um, and, you know, Derek, I know a little bit more active on Instagram, but seeing stuff out there, you know, from the the stuff that, that you all were doing and, 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 you know, being updated on kind of what the feeling was, what the vibe was, and just to see the way that the writers kind of kept to kind of inform people. It was great. And from my perspective, it helped me to follow along. So, um, yeah, I'm grateful for that. And, and I'm grateful that it seems like, you know, a wrong has been set right uh, when it comes to, um, you know, the conditions for for the WGA. Um, and now, of course, you know, we, we, we got to make sure the same thing happens with SAG-AFTRA. So um, uh, and, and, and then we can get back to work and get those five episodes rolling. Um, but in, in the meantime, you know, we get to talk about One Night in Koreatown, which is the fifth episode of season two. And I, I think that for, for me, I, I want to start off talking a little bit about the history surrounding the episode before we get into the, the episode proper. And um, I, I'd be very curious to know, um, and Ben, I'll start with you. Where were you and can you can kind of just contextualize what was going on in your life when the Rodney King verdict came down? You know, where were you on April 29th, 1992 and what was going on in your life and how did you see the events unfold? Uh, I was about a month out from graduating college at that point. Um, I was in Ann Arbor, Michigan at U of M. Um, so I was nowhere near Los Angeles. I mean, yeah. I was I was I'm an East Coaster by birth. And up until, you know, uh, my wife and I moved out here in 1999, I was, a, I was, a you know, middle of the country <laughs> to, to the right, to the right side of the country, uh, or east, I should say, and then moved here in, in 1999. So um, nowhere near Los Angeles, no real connection to Los Angeles. Um, so it was very much a, it was a little bit like watching something happening that, like, you had, I had no context for. Right. I had no understanding mm -hmm. of, the, of the city. I had no understanding of the of, you know, where this was in relation to the places that I'd heard of that I was aware of. So um, it was very much one of those things where you're watching something happening in real time going. Wow, we 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 really still have a long way to go, don't we? And and it was, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm neither part of the Korean community nor part of the black community nor part of the Latino community. So I, I'm, I'm watching it from as an outsider's point of view going, I, I, I have to try to understand what this is. And I, and I don't know because there are so many sides to that story. And that's something that when we sat down to write this episode, we kind of, you know, that's what I was able to sort of bring to, to, to this to the table on this was sort of the outsider point of view of going, okay, there are so many different sides to this. How can we tell a story that's going to have all those different sides to it? Mm, yeah. And within the episode itself, Ian has a great line where they kind of talk about that a little bit. And we'll, we'll talk yeah. more about that here in, in a bit, but Derek, same, same question, kind of where were you and, you know, can you contextualize how the events uh, unfolded for you? Sure. I mean, I was actually, I was in the military, so I was stationed elsewhere. And so when it all unfolded, but uh, I, I had friends that were back here, I had, you know, and in, in also in, in this, in, you know, in this day and age, I still have a lot of friends that were there and had a different experience. And so being able to talk to them about this. Uh, but at that point in time, being in the military, um, th there was a concern about if it was going to spread, if this was like this uprising, if this, you know, this unrest was going to actually start to affect because it did, it was sort of, an, you know, a, a huge impact that was happening uh, in real time where, you know, the anger was, was palpable, right? It was just very much a, yeah. um, 
a, a situation where there was a lot of questions and a lot of but but there was also things of like so much lack of um what's the word i'm looking for not so much lack of but definitely a uh, lack of surprise that that was that that was the way it was going to go down right it was like oh this mm. is you know it, of course it's going to go down this way because i think you know it, almost myself you know and and other friends uh you know since i've been living in los angeles hasn't happened thankfully you know in a in a quite some time but i've you know almost been pulled over like six times twice at gunpoint you know once handcuffed because all because i fit the description of someone you're looking for or they're you know going to take you in and ask questions later type of situation so it's like so you know the to see that the, the, the unrest that was happening and the anger and the sort of uh just spread like wildfire in in that moment uh you when you're sort of almost like helpless and wondering what you what you can do when you're halfway around the world watching this yeah. and thinking like this is so surreal that this is happening uh but yeah. not surprised that it's happening at this point in time right because i mean what led up to this whole thing of like these four men you know beat the living hell out of a of a man for a traffic stop right in that way yeah. of where it was so much so and then and then for them to be you know acquitted it was like it was thrown right back in everyone's faces. And so, but, but, you know, when you talk about in the, in the greater context of like over the years, as it everything again, like what led to that moment, how did it get so bad where it became in that moment of like, where people would say enough is enough. And then, you know, it's like, well, because this is systemic and it goes back, you know, a, a lot longer than just a couple of months building up to this moment. Right. So, yeah. uh, for, for, I think it was just the, if anything you're saying, you know, to answer your question, long story short, it was just feeling of, of helplessness, a little bit of hopelessness in that moment. And because you're just like, there was nothing you can do as you're just watching these fires spread, these people getting hurt, uh, you know, the barricades getting set up in all very, you know, specific uh, locations to protect, you know, uh, some yeah. people versus, versus not, you know, there was like all that type of stuff that was going on that you're just watching. Them. And the only thing is like back in that time, there was no internet to really feed you the 24 hour is you know there was not the 24 news hour you know uh news hour cycle right of the way that you have now um it was just continuous coverage but there was there was not like you know you're getting real-time updates from everybody it's either you know through yeah. secondhand through phone calls you know checking in or stuff like that or just relying on the news uh, the news broadcast stations yeah, it is fascinating to think of it from that perspective, because it was you know, like you say, the 24 hour news cycle had not really I mean, it was in that nascent stages, right? I mean, it really kind no. of kicked off with the Gulf War. And I think yeah. that this was something that that obviously kind of, you know, heightened things as well. And then, you know, and then you look at OJ and you look at kind of everything that spilled out of the 90s, you know, and into the early 2000s. By the time we got to 9-11, it was like, yeah, bam, we were there with mm -hmm. that in your face. And I think that that was the thing that kind of made the coverage more remarkable, especially for, you know, I was 10 years old living in a, a suburb of St. Louis at the time. And I just remember being frightened and saddened by it and not really understanding it completely because in my mind, of course, I thought like, I, I thought this was over. Right. You know, I thought that I, I thought I, 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 I thought that, you know, mom and dad's generation fixed it all. And, and then seeing this and realizing that that's absolutely not the case. And I can remember my father who at the time was very liberal and unfortunately, that's not where he ended up. But I can just remember audibly, you know, when the verdict came back, I, I just remember he made this noise, you know, and, 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 and I could tell that he thought that this was the absolute, you know, wrong call, um, which helped to kind of steer my, you know, moral compass. And something else that had kind of helped do that, quite frankly, was Quantum Leap. Because I, you know, I can remember distinctly the color of truth and seeing that episode. I, I think I was, you know, nine years old, and mm -hmm. um, I mean that that is seeing that, you know, and now having the chance to ha having spoken to Deborah a couple of times and getting to tell her point blank, like without you, like who knows where I, <laughs> I would have ended up, frankly, you know, that that right, really helped right. to shape, uh, a, a, you know, a, a lot of my thoughts and feelings. But um, 
you know, one of the things that I think is is hard to do is, is trace kind of where something begins. And obviously, in this case, we have this precipitating moment with the, the acquittal really setting things off. But the tensions had obviously been mounting for years and years. Absolutely. And, and even... And even more recently, to, to shift it particularly to like the, the tensions between, you know, blacks living in L.A. and Koreans living in L.A., there had been the murder of Latasha Harlins. And mm-hmm. I'm curious as to what, if any, influence that had on deciding to set the episode in Koreatown and not focus on maybe something else and where maybe that idea came from as opposed to focusing on a different aspect of it. Well, I mean, season one, Ray had already kind of put out into the into everyone's consciousness that he wanted to tell a story about this moment in time. Mm. So so for that reason alone, there was no question in our minds where we were setting the story. You know, we wanted it to be from, you know, and Derek has said this numerous times, like the, the you know, the different point of view that we don't often get to see is sort of the Asian American point of view on these events. We understand and we've talked, you know, people have talked a great deal about the black perspective on that trial and the impact because of the direct impact on that community. But that but there were other communities impacted and this event had a huge impact on the Korean American community. So being on a show with a Korean American lead, yeah. being on a show that, you know, gets to go to tell stories from points of view where you walk a mile in someone's shoes that you never really thought of there. It was sort of an, you know, I don't, I don't mean this in a bad way. It was a no brainer. It was, it was like, yeah. this, this has to be the version of the story we tell. And, and uh, I mean, that just, that, that, that sort of set it all up for us. We're like, well, great. Now we know exactly where to go with this. Yeah. We would fail at our job. If we, if we, ne- if we all of a sudden like, let's not do that story. They're like, yeah, you know what, Ray, we hear you, but we got this. We're going to tell this other story that has no Korean Americans in it, nothing about a Korean American family. And, you know, leap into that, you know, it's like that's right. <laughs> how do you right. get away with it, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, you know, honestly, it was one of the things that I loved about the episode is I, I love the fact that we got to see Ray in this situation, you know, or Ben rather in this situation where he is surrounded by other Korean Americans. And, and I, 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 I really appreciated that. And it was, it was a great perspective because Ben, to your point, it's not a perspective that we get nearly as much, especially about these events. I feel like it's, you know, if you if you do the work, right, like if you go and you read a little bit about it, and you're, you know, you watch a documentary, certainly there will be a focus on this part of, 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 the, of the events, but it's not necessarily always the focus. Um, so I appreciated it from that perspective as well. Um, so knowing that that was going to be the case uh, i'm very curious as to you know crafting this this story setting it in in, in a shoe store because you know, one of the things that uh came out of, of of the aftermath is that nearly half of the damage which reached almost a billion dollars worth of damage almost half of that was concentrated in koreatown mm-hmm. alone and you know all of these businesses mm-hmm. businesses that have been built by people you know, you know over decades were gone um, so mm-hmm. Derek, talk a little bit about the decision to, you know, I, knowing that we're going to set it in Koreatown to have that be part of the focus. Uh, yeah, I think that's definitely the, the idea of like, you know, that's almost like the Koreatown is that, uh, you know, that, uh, fifth character in this story, right. Where you you, you want to be able to breathe life into this community and see how it it's this impact of like, especially like with um with uh, Mr. Park, right? His you know him how he and his wife, you know, they came from Korea and they started up this business and this opportunity here in this neighborhood and you know to basically so that they could provide for their kids and and someday hand it off to their kids, right? But then they also where we were, you know, very uh, sort of like we wanted to, you know, have this commentary about how the the giant corporations that are coming in and pushing these small mom and pop stores out, right? Mm-hmm. Of the competition yes. and what's, what's you know the changes that were happening at that point in time, right? Of uh, big businesses coming yeah. in, pushing everything out to what we have to this day, right? 
Uh, so that was also kind of a, you know, our thinking behind that. And then it just, the other thing was just, again, when, once we realized that we wanted to do it in Koreatown and we were hoping that we were going to be able to do it in Koreatown, uh, but circumstances and timing did not allow us to actually do that. So we had to build our own sort of Koreatown with the streets and, you know, that's a, a credit to goes to, again, our production crew, yeah. our art department and, uh, you know, our, our yeah. director, Tamika Miller, who came in. And Tamika was, you know, she 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 brought the magic of of you know again what we did on the page, and then how she was like, okay, I see this, I get this, I'm excited about this, and then let's run with this, and you know, and was able to work with mm-hmm. everybody and to deliver this in this way, right? Um, and so, uh, and I always go back again, just keep knocking on the head. It's such a collaborative effort uh, to to bring all this together in such a short period of time. Too, that's the other thing. I, our our crew they're they're wizards in that way of where we were when they were building sets for you know ours they were already building sets for the next episode and dismantling for the mm. next because we only had seven days to shoot this uh normally right, yeah, it was you know, shorter had, than normal right yeah yeah so we had to be very economic you know sort of like sound in the way that we we're going to tell this story and so that's how the the shoe store came into being was also because of that of being aware that we needed one location that we can build this set the story in such a way uh where a majority of it takes place and and then and then the rest out on the street because of of the timing yeah, yeah. And the, way we, the way we shot it it was we we started with the ruined store yeah. And then it had to be cleaned up because yeah. <laughs> it all culminates with the mob coming in. Right. So so yeah. we weren't going to, you know, do all that and then have to read, you know, like it was it was the, the easiest way to do it was like start with the mess, then clean it up and then build to that 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 last, you know, trash can through the window moment and, and them coming in and having to run inside. And so, that in that magic of television, too, because like when you watch the episode, the next time you watch it you will see this sort of interesting thing of like where they had to, these are actors that all came together and this was their first days of shooting. Like the ambulance mm-hmm. scene, oh, yeah, that's right. like very, the, the ambulance scene was like one of the first things we shot. Wow. And then, and, yeah. and then, and then, and then we worked our way backwards from there. Uh, and so you could sign to see it like, you know, as they're trying to figure each other out and work with one another and stuff. Uh, and that's you know the the again the the exceptional talent that's on screen of everybody just understanding yeah. the you know oh. right that's fascinating uh, I I will definitely have to I'll keep that in mind but I don't think I, I mean I don't think you can see anything through it because it, yeah it, it it's they're wizards are that yeah right? our editors they're <laughs> wizards you know and, and like everybody does their job because that's the thing you know, like you think that you you know you, when you you're working on a show that everything's shot linearly right it's like oh we're gonna do act right. one today is like but you can't <laughs> you can't <laughs> sometimes you gotta shoot the the very last scene on the day one and pretend yeah. like that they you know be, and if there if there's no chemistry that's how you can tell, you know, it's like, oh, this might not work. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's going to be some changes made. Yeah. Um, there's be some changes. Yeah. It's interesting. I, you know, I just, I just recently watched boys in the hood and watched the special features. Um, mm-hmm. And it's funny because John Singleton actually did shoot that in sequence. And mm-hmm. one of the reviews that I read, I don't know if I agree with this, talked about the fact that the movie got better as it went along because he got more experience <laughs> as the, you know, as, as the shoot progressed. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, I, I, you know, I bring that up partially also because he, Singleton was involved in a documentary about uh, the, the riots and, 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 mm-hmm. and um, the aftermath. And, and it's a it's it's a wonderful documentary. It's available uh, over on Amazon Prime. But, uh, it, you know, walking walking through these some of these locations you know you see him walking through and being interviewed and talking about some of these things or you see some of the footage from from you know those days and so much helicopter footage obviously and it it feels it feels big and it's easy to feel a little disconnected with it but one of the things that the episode achieves that i really enjoyed is that it gives it almost a claustrophobic sense because we're in this store so much Everything feels very tight and compressed and the tension is, is, is there. Um, can you talk about, and Ben, I'll start with you. Can you talk about maybe the decision to set it 
in, in, in those terms, as opposed to having it kind of open up, like maybe it starts in the store and now you're out on the streets. And certainly some of that might be technical, but I loved the choice to keep things so claustrophobic. Yeah, I mean, because that's that's the one safe space you have. Right. Again, this, this is this is a little bit where both the reality of production and our needs for narrative kind of intersect mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in sort of a serendipitous way, because, again, knowing we have a seven day shoot, knowing we're not going to be able to cast tons and tons of extras, we're not going to be do, able to do a lot of screens. We also don't want to watch the story of what's going on on the streets. That's that's not really the story we wanted to tell. We yeah. wanted to tell the story of a family I and mean, we wanted to keep it intimate and personal and and, you know, and universal and relatable by putting them in a location that meant so much to this family and in this time of crisis was the only safe place they could be to give that sense of claustrophobia, to give that sense of, you know, insulated and hopeful, but at the same time terrified because it's all around you. And it, it, I, I think, you know, we, we also loved the notion when we were conceiving it to do a very sort of, you know, stage play ish version of, of a quantum leap episode mm -hmm. without actually being on a, on a stage. You yeah. Know, we have, we have the benefit of being able to go out and do, because we can cut away to headquarters, because we can, we can go out to the universal back lot, which again, credits the production team, making it look like a war zone. And, and to your point about like the helicopter shots that, I mean, there was one shot when we watched the cut that I was like, I forgot we got that shot when, <laughs> yeah. when, when, when Ben sees the rooftop Koreans on the marquee of the, of the movie theater. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, that's right. I forgot we got that high angle shot, which only increased the size and scope of this very small story. Absolutely. In, in a, in, you know, five seconds of screen time. But so, we knew that we, it's, it's a remarkable early moment. On, yeah. Early on, we knew that we wanted, we wanted to make sure we had that because that's such an iconic moment of, Koreans, uh, you know, Korean Americans on rooftops guarding their stores, right? And and you know with these guns and and just trying to you know fight off what you know what was happening at that at that at that time. Uh, and so we you know we, we were like, oh no, we we want we want that shot in there in that way. Yeah. Uh, it, it's uh, very you know it's because it's it's so iconic and and Ray wanted it as well and and it was just like again you know. Uh, just shout out and thanks to, you know, uh, people that that supported us 100 percent, you know, starting with Martin and Dean and then network in the studio of understanding like what, you know, story that we wanted to tell. And as Ben was talking about it, we wanted to make it claustrophobic and tight and just sort of you're just feeling the tension, the, the pressure coming in. Right. It's almost like the walls are closing in on these these poor people that are, you know, and Ray's trying. I mean, uh, and Ben's trying to hold it back you know trying to yeah. save these people you know and so so and it culminates into that moment of where they're you know in the storeroom and everybody's trying to break in and pound and they're and they're holding them at bay you know it's like that's that's where that that's sort of like that release point of like we got to this point right here and then and, and then and then you know you you, you switch it with uh with a with the next sort of crazy moment that happens um i don't know where we are if we can talk about are we talking is this a spoil spoiler section or non spoiler yes, we can uh, we can talk we could definitely talk spoilers about the episode not a problem oh, okay okay oh uh, yeah <laughs> i'm never quite well, certain but, but but even but even yeah. even between even between that moment that you're talking about and the one that you yeah. know we're, we're yeah. trying to spoil but not spoil uh, yeah. it is you know there is that in in the devastation of things for ben to get caught up on the magic story like that's yes. that's the other component to this this yep. episode which yep no. This setting really helped us yeah. uh, to, to get into magic and all the things that, that people are going to learn about him in this episode. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wanted I definitely want to dive into the magic story because there's there's so much stuff that, that resonated with me and that I felt like, you know, it's like, wow, what amazing stuff to give Ernie to do and and, and what a wonderful exploration of, of magic. Um, but before before we get to that, one thing that I'll, I'll say is that you get that sense of that pressure cooker in particular that, you know, when they're trying to come into the storeroom and then silence. And you almost think at that point as, as a viewer, you, you could be forgiven for thinking that, Oh, okay, I can take a breath. And then things get ramped up 
again right away. And there's this beautiful moment where Dwayne, we, we haven't mentioned yet, is is helping sweep up the shop and he gets mm-hmm. into the the confrontation with Jen. Um played wonderfully by by C. S. Lee of Dexter fame. Uh and and there's this beautiful moment where you know, Dwayne is just fed up and, and sick and tired. And, and you feel like so much of what he has to say in that moment about going to school and, and having these, you know, offers from Ivy league universities and, and only mm-hmm. being looked at as a thug and a criminal. And, and, and it, in the same way that those riots were born out of much more than a verdict, mm-hmm. this response is born out of much more than just what Jen has said to him. Derek, I'll start with you. Can you talk a little bit about that moment in particular? Because it, it's it's a very, to me, it's a very important moment in the episode, and 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 I think a wonderful distillation of a lot of that anger and frustration um, that that young black men in particular were feeling at that time. Yeah, I mean, you know, it comes back to that moment where it's like it's one hundred percent true when 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 magic, you know, explained to Jen is like you know that young black children have that talk even before they, you know, head out the house, they step out of the house. And so, you know, it's like for, for ben, you know, uh, Dwayne, played by Benji Flores, who was just fantastic, it was yeah. very much in this moment of like, this is where, you know, we were trying to land on the fact that it's like, again, two communities and 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 the POVs that, you know, that are, that are, uh, that are shared, but then also are questioned of like, because Jin is a product of the model minority myth, right? Of like, and and the opportunities that were presented for the Asian communities at that point in time that came over to America and then they were given a leg up versus the black communities that weren't given those, you know, those, those same opportunities. And so that's why a lot, so many stores and so many that were run by Korean shop owners and, and, you know, so they, you know, the, and so they bought into the, they bought into this, all the stereotype of, of, you know, of black people, especially young black men. Uh, and, and so there's this powder keg that was waiting to happen. Right. Uh, so in this moment, the, what was very important for us is like, we wanted to make sure that we get these two, again, these two opposing views, but then for Ben to point out that you have so much more in common than you don't, if you just stop talking at each other and start talking to one another right mm. uh and so that 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 in itself was yeah that was that was we 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 went through many different sort of like uh thought processes to to get to that and and then it came, you know it came out because there was there was a lot more that we wanted to do but again you just have to sure. all right how do we how do we boil it down into the time that we that you know that we're, that we're given uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's very much walking a tightrope because you don't want to also in that moment feel like that you're preaching. It's right. just more, you know, it's, it's much more of like, this is life. This is actually happening. This has happened and this is continues to happen. Um, and, and so this, this, this is truth that we're, we're showing in this moment and in this fictional, you know, story. Yeah, I you know you kind of mentioned the the challenges of of the time constraints, for instance, uh, uh, you know, running time of the episode. Ben, can you talk about maybe some more challenges of of, of you know creating an episode like this, uh, you know, specifically, and 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 what you have to do to maybe work within that you know frame, or or sometimes when you step outside and say, well, we're going to do it this way instead. I mean, I I think to, to what it's kind of what Derek said before. It's like you want to avoid being preachy. I, I'm not the person who should be making any statements of anything preachy because I haven't lived this experience. So all I can do is is come at it from the point of view of someone who's empathetic, who is you know who sees the the, the human side of it, and try and tell a narrative that is representative of the communities we are trying to tell a story for, that is relatable to the people who aren't part of those communities. And to have it be entertaining at the same time that maybe somehow, some way we get inside your brain and make you walk, step away from the world you, your, the worldview you may have and, and, and see it in a different way and go, I hadn't considered that. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't, I, I, I didn't know that. Ad- admitting you don't know something is a huge step forward to knowing something. And 
that's one of the, you know, that's the beauty of this show. I mean, again, once again, a credit to Deborah Pratt, who, you know, this, in our minds, when we sat down to write this, this, this was sort of our homage to Black on White on Fire. Yeah. Um, which, again, different, different time period, but a very sim, you know, had similar elements. You know, it mm-hmm. was a, 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 a riot, an uprising in Los Angeles story. Hers was Watts. This was, this was, you know, 92. Um, but, you know, part of what this show does so beautifully is to sort of take these turning point, mo- these ugly turning point moments in our history and apply an element of hope to it. Um, you know, we, we often talk about the four H's of the show, you know, heart, humor, history, and hope. And, you know, the way this episode plays out, it seems pretty fucking hopeless throughout. And I think, you know, for, for the younger generation growing up now, seeing a very, a, a world that is, you know, kind of at each other's throats, we're kind of on fire. It's been rough and it's still rough reminding them that there is still hope for things. You know, we, we, we've come a long way. We still got a long way to go. And, and, you know, stories like this entertainment like this is the kind of thing that, you know, it's like an earworm brain worm. It gets into your mind and it, and it makes you think. And, and hopefully uh, what comes out the other side of it is something positive and hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think this is actually a perfect opportunity to segue a little bit into magic and I'm going to kind of start towards the end of, of, of his story of this episode, but I, I definitely want to go back. But one of the, one of the beautiful lines uh, in, in the episode, you know, magic says the sparks of injustice may vary, but systemic oppression will always light the fuse. And no matter how much progress we make, that will never change. And I, you know, he's using his context, which in this instance spans basically these like three generations because we Mm -hmm. learned that he was in detroit in 67 where Mm -hmm. some of the you know just most awful moments in that long hot summer took place and 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 then we flash forward to 92 you know 25 years later and then almost 25 more years later here we are and Mm -hmm. you know we're standing in the aftermath of, of of george floyd and black lives matter and you hear him say a line like that and I mean, I'm, I'm literally, I'm getting chills as I'm talking about it because you can't help but be overcome with frustration and sadness and hopelessness. And yet you see these people, these characters doing the very human thing, which is to carry on and to keep trying, to keep trying to do the right thing, to keep trying to set those rights wrong uh, or set those wrongs right, excuse me. Um, Derek, can you talk a little bit about that line and magic's journey from you know a young black man in 1967 right on the precipice of going to vietnam you know and then being in confronted with that situation on the leap with ben and everything that he's going through in that in that current day because magic's story in some ways throughout the course of this episode it really is kind of the spine almost just as much as anything else that happens yeah, I mean, it goes back to the moment where you're talking about the time of trauma that a person carries, right? And for Magic, he carries a lot of different sorts of trauma, including the fact that everybody thought Ben was gone for three years and what that did, that did a number on him in a way that he never thought, you know, where he even said at the beginning of the story, when he says to Ian, he says, I'm a former Navy SEAL, I don't rattle, right? That was, that was deliberate. That was specific because we wanted to show that demonstrate that even this admiral, this decorated admiral and this person that has gone through so much, including having Sam Beckett run your life for a little bit, you know, (laughs) it's like, you would think, you would think as a black man that this white man that jumped into you, (laughs) like to ruin your life for a little bit, that's got to do a number on your head, right? (laughs) You think about it, like, the rest of your life. Uh, but at the same time, he handled it. And, you know, it was like, and he was part of the program. So you never know what's going to trigger a moment. And that was very important for us to like demonstrate, like, this is a moment that he thought that he had long forgotten that it was bit past him. And then, you know, seeing the frightened, you know, uh, mm. the, the helplessness of not being able to help Dwayne in that moment as these cops are look, searching for him that you know it was like it just triggers something in it that goes much deeper and it's like because it's like oh like he said he's like whether it's 67 92 or you know or today it's it doesn't change 
and then you know but when we but as setting that up as you go through the rest of the story when Jin does stand up for Benji and they come together to save you know is like uh, Sunny that was like where we're saying we're not we're not trying to say like we solved it right. but for magic it does like there's that hope right it is like going back to what Ben was saying is like instilling hope not just in our, for our viewers, but for our characters and for magic to say like, okay, I'm going to be okay. I think I'm, you know, this is, it's like where there might, you know, there, there's still hope. There's still, there's hope, you know, there's still, you know, there's promise of change. Uh, yeah. And so by, even by him, like making the call, you know, to, to, to Beth to saying like, Hey, instead of dinner, can you come with me? You know, because that was, an, uh, you know, another part of it, again, of just like who this person is. And, and it's like, it's not just like, oh, solved racism and I solved alcoholism, I'm done. Right. You know, it's like, yeah. it like that's not, you know, that is not the intent. And so we wanted to make sure that it was like, and let's not kid ourselves. You know, we've been singing his praises all week. It's like, but it's Ernie Hudson. It's right. like, <laughs> you know, let's start there. And if you're not <laughs> writing for Ernie Hudson, if you're not, do, you're doing something wrong. And so we, yeah. this was, you know, it just was just sort of a perfect timing of like where it was in the story and how this all came together. And we were just like, all right, well, let's put our best foot forward and let's give, give something Ernie can really sink his teeth into. And we didn't even know it at the, at that point in time where, because he shared with us when we were on set that he actually was in Detroit. Wow. <laughs> so this you know so he was able to definitely bring his own experience unique you know uh pov to this in a way that was just very much you know with, with working with tamika because tamika had a long conversation with him and getting it and it was just because it is a it's it's a bit you know the challenge of really digging deep in that in that moment when we needed to for him to to get there and he did um Cause that yeah. you know he kills it in that speech. I was just like, yes, single tear. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's, 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 <laughs> like Derek was saying about like the perfect the perfect timing of it all. It's like we we've been lucky that two seasons in a row we've landed episode five, which always comes after some major turning point in the Ben Addison relationship <laughs> that that we get to sort of riff off of, and the fact that she was no longer going to be his hologram. And mm -hmm. someone else was going to have to step into that chamber. And the question, you know, that we, when we sat down, we're like, well, who's it going to be? And we were both like magic. Yeah. <laughs> Should we do magic? <laughs> and, and, and the fact that we got to, we're like, well, now we're off to the races because, yeah. because now we know what we want to do. Well, one of the things that I, I, I said this about last week's episode, Lonely Hearts Club, and, and I thought that it, it was, to me, it was one of the first episodes, barring maybe this, the season finale from the first season that, it, it, it felt to me that we didn't just necessarily have parallel stories where there were some like echoes of the leap at the project, but they felt fully intertwined and intersecting in these really lovely ways. And this episode does that too, where there's, there's so much that, that, you know, intertwines with magic's story and what's happening in the leap and how it affects magic and, and, and how that ripples back at the project. And we get some beautiful scenes born out of these moments that, you know, the whole team, I mean, there's wonderful stuff for everyone, you know, and, and, and like the scene between Jen and magic is no pun intended magical. I mean, it's just, it's just really beautiful, but we also get this wonderful scene between Addison and Ian. And, yeah. and again, it's all, you know, it, it's all so connected. Um, and it, it, to me, it, I don't know. There, there's, there's just been this shift where I feel like this season, which again, I, I cannot help but be a bit in awe over the fact that it wasn't like you all took a couple of months off and then came back to work on season two. You just went straight through, and to be no able to, ha off. yeah, to be able to yeah. handle kind of that shift that the show has undertaken because of the, the the gap in time, because of you know everything that changed. It's just remarkable. I, I I almost feel like it just it gave you all of this this freedom to go in these new directions. Because with magic, you know, we got the moral arc of the universe line in in season one, and it felt like there's this there's this person that like he's he's hope you know personified. Like he's just he's mm -hmm. just amazing. And now we're getting to see someone who's battling alcoholism, who is trying out this new relationship with Beth. 
who is getting into the imaging chamber and and having this you know, moment of doubt and, and and exiting and I I just think that it's 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 created so many more opportunities to focus on these characters and these human beings, which I love. So that said, let's talk a little bit about that scene with Ian and Addison because I feel like Ian is obviously going through some stuff this season. You know, they are in an interesting place, and and we don't obviously we don't really follow up on on the chip stuff or anything like that from from the last episode but it's clear that they are struggling too and 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 it's it's interesting to see these characters kind of struggle in different ways and with Addison being off the 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 the, the leap and not being the hologram can you talk a little bit about the kind of the genesis of this scene and what you hoped for in putting the two of them together in this, in this way, in a very different manner than we usually see them together, because generally it has to do with the leap because that's where Addison's focus is. Ben. I mean, a lot of the genesis of that scene for me was acknowledging that because we were revealing such a big thing about something that happened in the three year gap that we didn't see, which is mal- magic's alcoholism wanted to see how that impacted any of our characters. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and knowing we were only going to have a finite amount of space to do it. It Ian felt like the most logical person to have that, to, to have a reaction to that given their, I don't want to say culpability, but I will say responsibility for the events that, that led to the, (laughs) the, the entirety of season one. And, ended the way they did and now here's this yet another unexpected outcome that they are all as as, as they so uh, you know put it and admit it wasn't their best their best metaphor uh you know that, um you know it left the, you know the, the team in, in in a nuclear wasteland dealing with the emotional fallout yeah. um you know and and so it, it just seemed like that they would be the one to to express those feelings and to have Addison who, who, who knows that better than Addison, what, what, what the fallout of, of everything is. Yeah. And, and, you know, the fallout of her choices over the past three years, you know, mourning Ben, burying Ben, finding new love, thinking that this is not my life now only to have Ben come back into her life. Um, she's just trying to do the best she can. She doesn't have the answer. She doesn't know what the best thing to do is in this moment that they, you know, they just had their, you know, their, their Lieber hologram breakup. Right. right? So it's just, it's been a series of breakups for those two. <laughs> um, so, so just to see the two of them comfort each other uh, felt like, again, and, and we're reminding them to sort of just stay on target. We know, we know the way to get through this is, is by solving our bigger problem, which is to still save Ben. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's such we're a kind quiet of moment. I was just going to say just real quick. I mean, it's just such a nice quiet moment, you know, that Caitlin and, yeah. and Mason were able to bring, you know, because of their relationship with one another as, you know, friends, everyone, you know, it's actually, that's the, you know, the great thing about the show is like everybody okay. actually is, you know, they're, they're friends and, and, and uh, great with one another offset as well as onset you know that's the so um you know to have those those type of relationships and being able to be in those moments and find those moments working together even if it's even if there's smaller moments like that you know it just it just adds such more you know that much more depth to every character and that's so that's something that we always are as a as you know as a writing staff just always talking about the emotional moments with our characters because we want to care about them. You know, it's like, if you don't care about them, then why are they on screen? Absolutely. Uh, You know, and I I think that one of the things too, um, that, that you guys get the chance to do over the course of the episode is to reinforce, I think a lot of um, what makes these characters great and what makes them interesting and you also get to play with some continuity with the original series because Beth is back. Mm-hmm. And I, I remarked about this in, in, a, in a conversation I had with someone and then I, I am not sure who oh, it, it might have been. It was Drew Lindo, actually. I, I remarked to the fact that Susan Dial does some amazing work in this episode. 
because and I and I want your guys' perspective on this because there are times when she's talking to magic. It's not in the dialogue at all. But the weight of Al is Absolutely. clearly on her shoulders. Yes. So I'm curious, Derek, can you talk a, a little bit about that? I mean, well, it's, you know, it's Susan. <laughs> it's like, you said. <laughs> let's, you know, let's start there because she does have history. It's not like, you know, someone that we, you had to recast as Susan. It's, uh, right. I mean, as Beth, right? It's like, this is somebody that has had that, that relationship and that weight on the history of the original series and being able to come back in this way. Uh, and it was just such, it's so much fun. So that she is haunted by what Al Calavici went through. So you saw all the ups and downs and saw how Al was trying to save his best friend and saw what that did to Al, you know, even though they held together. And so for her, there's definitely, again, you know, we come back to the whole thing of like, everybody has these triggering moments. She's seeing this is a, mo you know, this is a moment that's kind of triggering for her. It's like seeing this, this, this new love in her life, this new relationship and walking the very similar halls, right? <laughs> As always of like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Hey, like, uh, I, I've seen this before and I've seen where this can go bad. And so it didn't help when all of a sudden she finds an empty bottle hidden, right? And then it's like, we just got over this part. <laughs> it's yeah. like, you know, it's like, and so she's like, okay, this has been, you know, we're one year in together. But if you're having these type of problems now, what's going to happen the more that you become obsessed with trying to pull Ben back it is the same way that I was trying to find, figure out every way to bring Sam back and where that took him. And so now she's seeing magic. It's like, what happens if you keep going down this road and you, if you keep yeah. making the poor choices while you're doing it. And so she's trying to be like, I want to be supportive. I want to be here for you, but I've done this dance before. Right. And so right. That's, you know, so again, but for Susan and her performance and being able to have that understanding and, and histories, though, she knows how to bring it into a scene. The winds, the winds have struck again. <laughs> Santa Ana! Okay. Now just... <laughs> yeah, now I just... Uh, I don't know. I don't know what happened, uh, where it went, but yeah, that's no the... Uh... <laughs> I got Ben Santa Ana joke because <laughs> you're not frozen on my end. So that's the that's the hard part. Um, long story short, Susan's awesome. And before I freeze again, Susan's awesome. She brings a lot of weight and understanding to it in just enough where, you know, she knows how to deliver in those scenes. And then also just playing off of Ernie. The two of them are just fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it's really it was really wonderful to see, you know, the two of them together in that way, because I, I had I had heard through the grapevine completely, totally off the record that there was a scene that was shot last season that was a little longer, that was a little flirtatious between the two of them that didn't actually make the screen. So when I, you know, when when, when this happened and when I realized like, oh, they're together, it was it, it, it was nice to kind of see them get the opportunity to work more together, because obviously they'd had those scenes very, very early on um in season one yeah that was uh, uh Annalise episode, right? that was 116 yeah yeah 116 yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we produced that episode so. oh yeah. nice <laughs> yeah. we saw it get shot and, and yeah and you can you can thank Annalise for for being the 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 constant shipper of of uh, magic and Beth she is yeah she's been pushing this narrative for like so long and it's like all right all right fine we'll do it we'll do it It'll be really interesting to see what fans think, because I know that you know, some fans, quite frankly, seem to be uh, having a, a little bit of difficulty with the idea that Addison has moved on. Um, and uh, so to, to think about Beth moving on, you know, it'll be interesting to see what some folks think. But um, I, I, I love it. And I think that it, it provides this wonderful dimension for, for both of the characters and, and gives you know, the actors some great stuff to do. You mentioned the fact that they've been together a year. We, you know, we find out that through this wonderful scene between Ben and magic that magic's been sober for 353 days. Mm -hmm. Now I, this is all, this is, this takes us off into the, the fan wank territory, quite frankly, but I can't help but think about those first 12 days when they were together and magic's still a mess. There was something about having him not get sober until they, you know, started dating for maybe a couple of weeks that I really appreciated. It, I don't know why it hit me, but it did. Ben, can you talk to that at all as, as far as like the decision to, cause it seems like a specific choice to not just have it be like, Oh, he's been sober for a year. They've been together for a year. Right. Yeah. Well, cause that right away tells you that she's the reason she has had an amazing impact on this man's life. 
that made him say, I have to stop this and I have to fix myself. I have to, I have to find a way to not let this thing be the destruction of me. And I have to find a way to live with this. And, and, you know, I think again, also uh, another community I'm not a part of, I, I do not struggle with addiction, so I can't speak to the reality of being an addict, but, empathetically and trying to understand what, what, what people who do struggle go through. Oftentimes they credit someone as being the, the person that helped turn their life around, whether it be a friend or a relative or a sponsor or whoever it is. And to have, to give magic someone in his life that could do, could be that person. It felt like, you know, once the two of them started together, the, the the process of healing and 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 you know uh, coping with his addiction, she she was the catalyst. And now yeah. that just felt like a very simple dialogue way to sort of suggest that without having to overtly say it. Sure, sure. You know, don't want yeah, to beat you I... over the head with the dialogue and exposition, but I want you to understand <laughs> why what this woman really means to his his journey of struggle. And it goes yeah. back to your whole point of like we only have a certain amount of real estate. So like even with 116, where we wanted to do more, a lot of times it just gets cut, that just gets cut down. So you want to make sure that you have the the salient points, the moments that actually matter versus the uh, what's the word you use, Ben? Chuffa? The the uh... yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's the, you know, the, the shoe leather, right? Of like you just yeah. it, it, you don't want to go, you know, belabor a, a scene or a point. And so it's very much sort of like, okay, well, where can we get the most in that moment that we need? Well, <laughs> you know, I, I think that one of the things too, just speaking a little bit to that economy of storytelling and, 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 and not wanting to beat people over the head with certain elements, the, you know, the, the, the episode drops in a few things here and there that, that are specific to like the news coverage, the verdict return, for instance, and the other piece that gets dropped in. And I, and I really, and I, I, I want to, just throw this out there and, and get both of your perspectives on it and feelings on it because it's it's um, it feels loaded and weighted in a lot of ways. You know, even watching some of the documentaries and, and doing some reading that I've done, it's it you know compassion obviously enters into it, but it's again there's more perspectives to it. And and the other piece of kind of footage that you use is Reginald Denny, and to anyone who's familiar with the uprising at all, like that's a name that you you know you just you just have to know. Derek, can you talk about that that choice? And was that was that something from the script? Did that come from production? Where, you know, where did that choice come from? No, that came from us. It came from us in that moment because we just were trying to demonstrate and show like the escalation of yeah. like where it was, you know, because this is at the start. This is at the beginning of of you know basically right. night one, right? And so the tension building and the urgency that Ben is trying to convince his father and everyone else that we have to get the hell out of here. And so by the time that when you see the Reginald Denny moment, it is now, it is, it is the point of no return. Like this is like, this has become so bad in a way where it's like, okay, this is not going to die down. This is not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, you know, and then yeah. also because again, if like, you know, Ian Ian says in a moment uh, where there was so much confusion about messages that were being shared and, you know, the, the points of view that were just coming from every different direction. And we even have that demonstrated it with the uh, with with Jin listening to Korean radio, because that was also instrumental for the Korean the, mm -hmm. uh, the American community. That's how they were getting their information. It wasn't just on the TV, the, you know, with the local news. It was through the in radio community that was, you know, uh, that was sharing real time information. Right. So, yeah. And didn't the, didn't the radio programs actually encourage like Korean Americans to arm themselves as well? Like, wasn't that where where some of that came from? Yeah, it was, again, the passing along the information of like how to protect yourselves and, and what to do. And then, the, it, yeah, that was definitely how, you know, it, that was the only way that Korean Americans and Koreans that were, you know, that were trapped in this situation, that's the only source that they could trust other than word of mouth yeah. from neighbors and friends, right? So and that's how they were also able to get that up on the rooftop so quickly in that way of being able to sort of like protect their stores. So 
that that so when yeah we're going back to your whole thing about like you're saying with the original denny moment it was just more we just needed a visual and luckily we were able to get that visual i mean it's a, it's a horrific moment and a tragic tragic yeah. moment of what happened uh but it is such a visual again sort of like cornerstone moment in whenever you talk about the la rough uprisings of of seeing, you know, the the harm and the damage, not just of the stores burning, of you know, but people being injured and and you know that were just caught up in this a way that was like so um, so yeah, that was just more that was more of our decision of like, hey, we need something that you can see up on TV that you know, like okay, it's getting bad, <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so yeah, we used to, I mean, we wanted it, we wanted to create a timeline, like that was sort of. Yeah. And it felt like we have we have we have certain touchstone moments we want to hit. Obviously, the verdict. Obviously, that. Those felt like these are the ones that we can we can put in. We'll give a clear picture of where we are in the day, and we can then spend the time working on the story of our characters, which is ultimately you know we don't we didn't right. want to take away from that. We we wanted to augment it. Sure. Right? So yeah. it wasn't like again we're not just going to be a this isn't the History Channel. <laughs> this is this is Quantum Leap, and we want to you know we want to give you a context and tell the story of these people yeah yeah it, so the story of the people in that way of again it was like everybody has having their memories and their perspectives and like i said i was talking to some friends and i give out a shout out to a mutual friend of ours her name is paula Yu, and she has a book actually coming up called rising from the ashes and it talks about these very moments and again from the korean american perspective and what what happened and what's going on uh she's a fellow writer um and in talking with her, you know, I was able to get some some different uh, sort of intel and, you know, information that I was looking for. And, and we, you know, we, we wanted to be very sort of careful of like how in the timeline that we're playing with again, because we knew exactly like this is not going to be over these six days. We're not going to have them hold up over and then, you know, and you cut away from right. a commercial break and you come back and it's day four and they're still hold up, you know, sure. <laughs> it's like. We were like, no, we go. This is all in one night. We're gonna get in, get out of this story, and get as much as possible, you know, and and yeah, and just again, and and then and personalize it as much as possible. And again, not so much making a commentary on the on the, on everything that was happening over those six days, but just in the, what's happening to this family, what's happening to this group right. of people, you know, what was happening to Louisa, how she couldn't get home to her yes. kid, right? That's. Right, but again, she was a, just an, a, another person that was affected by this in a way that we wanted to make sure that we we had that on screen. Yeah, you know, it, I'm great. I'm glad you brought Louisa up because I would hate to leave her out. But one of the things too that's also and it's and it's again that wonderful shorthand where you don't have to have like a a, a ton of information about it. But there's this moment where after Sonny's been shot, you know, she she goes to tend to him and she has that line about like you know I've dealt with gunshots before. And mm -hmm. I and I think it's just a stark reminder that that time, that location, it's like, yeah, gun violence was was a huge issue. And yeah. and, and 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 to see the effect that, you know, arming themselves had on this community on that particular day and that people died. I think that that's one of the things that sometimes, you know, gets neglected. We, we see a lot of these images and we hear a lot about the trial and we hear a lot about the destruction and the monetary value, et cetera, et cetera. But 63 yeah. people died. And, mm -hmm. and, and there's, and there's some, you know, some very famous footage in Koreatown and there's a, you know, like a young Korean boy on, on the ground, you know, well, maybe not a boy teenager, but you know, dead as this shootout is taking place. Yeah. Um, you know, having Louisa in this location and, and, and again, I think you're right. Cause it is about the people. It's, it's the same thing with Dwayne. It's like the idea that we, you know, this group of people is, is, is put in this situation and you can't tell a whole story about, you know, the riots, right? You're not the history channel, like you said, and instead you can tell this very yeah. human story about these people. Talk a little bit about the choice to include Louisa and, and, and what her story meant, you know, to, to the episode, but also to, to you guys to tell the story, you know, to have, to, to have um, her character's perspective in the mix as well. Well, I mean, she's, you know, she's a nurse and a mother. And, and so she is not, someone who's worried about a store. She's not worried about a business. Her, her concerns are different. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, the moment where she sees her car burning and realizes this tool that I use to sort of make my living and support my family is now in ruins for no reason of anything that I did. 
right? I, she's neither black, she's neither Korean, she's not, you know, she is, she is a, a, a Latina woman who is kind of caught in the middle of this event and now can't make, it doesn't, you know, is barely making ends meet, can't afford insurance to, to you know, to pay for a new car to, to start over. She's someone who's caught in the system that, if you're not on the right side of things, you get screwed. And, and so, she, so she's, she's collateral damage. You know, her world is, is being threatened by these events. And it just, she's a reminder that it impacts everyone. Yeah. Right. The, it, it wasn't just, it, it, again, it's about community. It's, it's literally, it's about community. And we are all one big community, regardless of the, the different communities we may belong to culturally, personally, ethnically, whatever. We are all part of the, those people were all part of the Los Angeles community that was torn apart by, you know, a really bad decision. Yeah. And yeah, because it wasn't, these, it wasn't these, are, just, these are the consequences of those actions. Yeah, because it wasn't just racism. We we're also talking about classism. Right. And that yes, was a big absolutely. that was a big that was a big part. Again, when they started putting up the barricades to protect Beverly Hills to make sure that they, you know, then in the fear of like, you know, they were like going to make their way up to Rodeo Drive. So, they, you know, where they're putting more of their time and energy to make sure to keep everybody back, you know, keep them down south. That's, you know, a statement on on, again, of the haves and the have nots. Right. Um, yeah. And so but also the other thing is like, yes, when we do, you know, we, we hear the stories of the L.A. uprising is always about the black community and the Korean American community. But also, they like said it was like the Latin X community. They, they, they were, you know, a big part of this. Uh, Absolutely. And, and, you know, and 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 the other, you know, the other POCs that were there, that were also caught up in this because it is this melting pot in South Central, in Koreatown, in you know all these areas, right? And um and and so we wanted to make sure that this was again reflective of that of that time. So yes, Louisa being caught up in this, she's you know, and she's just a nurse and she's just trying to raise her family, but she is a part of that greater community. And 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 this, so the confusion and the fear and the frustration of like I'm just trying to make ends meet, you know I want to do my part and contribute and be a part of it because as a nurse she is being that sort of in that selfless position of helping others and saving other people's lives day in and day out, and then this is the sort of reward that she gets like all I just wanted to do was get a pair of shoes so that I can just continue to keep working and make sure and provide for right. my kids and get you know and right. then get caught up so. so. Uh, but then, but when, you know, push comes to shove, she steps up, she steps yeah. up because again, it's like, because she's not an outsider, she is a part of this. And, and so, you know, and she does what she, she knows how to do, which is save people's lives, help people, sa you know, save them, people's lives in that yeah. way. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned the Latinx community and, and we haven't had the chance to actually talk about that within the historical context, but you know, one of the kind of more famous, I think, images that, that came out of the positive images that came out of this is the, is Edward James almost got a broom mm. and went down and started like sweeping up some of these streets and, 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 and people just started to join him. And, and he really did. He, what, he, he like kind of just went out there on his own volition and did that. And, and, and the impact that it had on all of these communities that are living, you know, within, you know, next door neighbors in some cases, obviously. Um, yeah. And, 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 and I think that it was, you know, it was, it was a wonderful idea. And, and of course, much like paging Dr. Song, quite frankly, there's, there's, there's this beautiful diversity to the episode that it's not just focused on, on, on one group of people. And that, and that goes to, you know, I mean, obviously having a woman of color as the director even as well, I think speaks to that, that level of diversity throughout the episode. Um, you know, we, we, we see uh, the, the images obviously with, with Reginald Denny, which, which are awful. We see the images of these, these policemen being acquitted um, and then later on, we have the scene of the the police officers searching for Dwayne and eventually, you know, holding Dwayne at gunpoint when he's trying to get uh -huh. to the ambulance. Um, but another thing that's that's done really well without focusing too much on it is the complete absence of the police in a lot of respects and about how yep. that was, you know, that was one of the major failures um, early on was that there was no attempt to really confront this understandable outrage and 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 anger um, that they they hightailed it, they hid, 
Um, can you talk about the decision to show that without necessarily telling that? Because it was something that certainly came across to me and I think it will come across to other viewers. But again, you didn't, you didn't really, you know, hit people over the head with the fact that they're not there. Well, because it wasn't that story. We weren't telling, we weren't trying to tell the episode about police brutality, police injustice in that way. It was just more about the greater impact and the less, and the lack of presence of them in, in a way that they're supposed to be there to serve and protect. And unfortunately they failed, you know, a lot, not, you know, not all of them, because you don't want to paint them with a, with a brush that way. But in that time, in that period, it was very much evident that there was you know people that were making decisions that felt like that there's only a certain amount of people that we're going to look after and protect everyone else is criminals and we'll break them down and and do what we need to do so it was very what ben and i what we set out you know initially set out we were like we're not going to concentrate on the police at any given point in time and then yeah. we had a very clear image of like that moment when Dwayne is hiding that was always there that was something that i always wanted to do was just make sure that we just see Again, the the frightened the frightened POV of this young man is he's seeing these boots on the ground, right? Just walking by, searching for you, and that in that in itself is just terrifying, of like being yeah. so close and knowing like what has already happened, what's happened to Rodney King, what's all that type of stuff in that moment. You just like you just illustrate it, and you want to make you want to focus all the attention on Benji and magic. Right. Yeah. And not on the cops. That's why we only the only time that we finally see the cops is like in the final confrontation. But even then, it's more of a of a, a still in a way of, like you know, keeping distance on that. It's never there's never the, you know, close dialogue and the, and the change of heart. It's more about the stand of of Jen protecting this young man and wanting to save his own son and telling them to do their job. Yeah. And then, you know, they, and then, and then they, then they back away because they're called away. It's not like, because they, it's a, it's a change of heart. It's right. just more like, it's a, you know what path of least resistance. Let's get out of here. We got, you know, we got elsewhere to be. Right. Yeah. And so it was, they were being asked to fall back pretty far too. Yeah. So yeah. It was very much self-preservational. Yeah. And, it, and it was like, so we, if anything, we we're just sort of like, if you wanted to create the, the phantom presence of them, but not the actual, you know, again, was that that was not because that wasn't the focus of our story. And so we wanted to make sure that we never were telling that story because you yeah. can tell that story. But that the, but this isn't right. that what this episode's about. Right. That's. So you, you'd mentioned um, the, you know, and I, I don't want to take up too much of your guys' time, but you'd mentioned using kind of black on white on fire as a bit of a touchstone. And one of the things that, I mean, that's one of my favorite episodes of the classic series, bar none. You know, I, I, I easily put it in my top five, you know, if not like top three. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I love the episode. I love the fact that, you know, you mentioned earlier about kind of a, a, the stage play in, in essence that this episode is, which I'm sure you guys are aware, but just in case listeners aren't, that's how Black on White on Fire started out. Deborah Pratt started writing it as a stage play. And uh, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't about Quantum Leap or Sam or anything. She was writing independently of that. And they translated it to, to the episode. But the a couple of the things that stand out to me about that episode is that obviously, like, you know, the backdrop is Watts, but it's not about Watts, you know. And it doesn't have a happy ending. That mm. episode is one of the few episodes of the series that does not have a happy ending. Right. So I'm curious, when approaching One Night in Koreatown, was there ever any inclination on your parts for this episode to not have a happy ending? Not that everything obviously is tied up with a beautiful bow and, you know, we've cured racism or anything like that or, you know, injustice yeah, yeah, yeah. has been solved. But I'm curious. From I, I would say no. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll just say for me, like, in my mind, I... I, I I wanted this to end on a positive note. Yeah. Um, again, knowing we weren't going to solve the, the specific topic of racism, I wanted the, the 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 future, the history that will come for the Park family, to be a proof that, despite these setbacks and these tragedies, that good can come of things. Right. Yeah. That that, that, yeah. that you don't lose hope. That that you don't lose sight of the fact that good can come. And that Dwayne was not going to be just a statistic. There was going to be another statistic. You know, that was definitely yeah. the thing of like, didn't want to, you know, didn't want to uh, dwell or even 
walk away with more black trauma. That was, so that was never the intent. That was this like, there's enough stories that do that. And this is not that story. Right. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah. It's like, so we, we weren't telling boys in the hood. We weren't telling, you know, right, we weren't telling, right, right. you know, it's like, we weren't telling menace to society or right? even though it's of those time frame, you know, that time period. Right. right. It's like, but with, with Benji, it's like, you know, it was very important is, you know, for him to play the role of Dwayne, that there is again, hope and optimism at the end of this, because also this is the show that we want to be a part of. Uh, you know, yeah. there's definitely, you can have your, your sad moments, cliffhanger moments and stuff like that. But when it's for Ben's missions, you kind of, you know, you want him to succeed because he's walking in these other people's shoes and this, and then this way, this woman is so close and personal. There was just no way that we would ever want to do this, to, you know, to, to Ray. Yeah, much right. less, you know, just like, and, and, just, and again, the telling this story in this way of like, I, yeah, we, we both Ben and myself, we were very much like, let's walk away feeling proud and, and actually that, you know, there's something accomplished here in a way that makes people think, makes people reflect, uh, and, and not necessarily feel so sad that they're going to be like, oh, <laughs> I'm going to, you know, it, it, like, I don't know if I'm going to watch any more episodes after this. No, right. <laughs> that's, that, that's the opposite of what we wanted to do, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, yeah, it was never a... Uh, it was never a challenge or anything like that again because it was again D Martin and Dean and and the rest of the incredible writing staff of of, of you know everybody that we work with uh, when we were working on this story it was all supportive and and everybody got that and so um, there was never any pushback of like no it needs to end with him getting arrested and <laughs> like and then and, and, uh, and then uh, uh, you know. Uh, Ben's character uh, goes to the Marines. You never hear from him again. It's like, oh god. Right, right, right. <laughs> like, well, I, 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 you know, I love. I mean, because some episodes, uh, you know, we don't always get a wrap up, and um, yep. and that was true of the classic series too. I know there are some people that don't think that's true, but listeners, it's true. Some episodes of the classic series didn't have Al wrap everything up at the end, but we do get a lovely wrap up here from magic. And, you know, we learn that Dwayne and Sonny start the, the shoe company. They get this empire mm -hmm. going that, you know, uh, Danny gets back from the military and becomes the first CFO of the company that Jen uses the insurance money to support them, you know, and, and, yeah. and, and, and it does, it, it ends on that, that, that message of hope and positivity and, and the good that can come out of these, these awful, awful moments. Um, I want to I want to talk about two more things real quick, and 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 we kind of danced around it a little bit, but I want to go straight to it. And I should have asked it earlier, quite frankly, if I'm being honest. Can you talk about collaborating with Ray on this episode? What he brought to it, as far as you know, it's a story that he wanted to be told, and 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 what that was like to kind of you know to to have the lead and 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 know that this is something that's important to him and and craft this story and 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 what it meant to him unfortunately you know right now i can't talk to him and i know you, you guys can't speak for him but i am very curious as to what that was like uh derek uh it, ray is ray right it's like you can't ask for a better person to to you know to write for to work with uh, it's like he sets the, you know, the example and it sets the tone of like when he steps on the set, he is kind to everybody, whether you are the director, another cast member, all the way down to the, you know, the, the, the first, you know, the PA that's starting out for their first show ever. Uh, he is kind, generous and, and collaborative. Uh, and so it was very easy to talk. And, and this is something, again, he wanted to do. And this is something that we wanted to do. Um, and and so when it when it started happening, it was it was it was fun. And then also, again, it was just in that way of like, I wanted to for myself personally, I was like, I wanted to bring that Asian American POV front and center, because even though he is the star and he is this Asian American, it's like telling a story about an Asian American family. It, uh, especially as one as important as in, in this time in history of this, it was that was very much a, you know, a calculated sort of decision of like, hey, let's make sure that if we're going to do this, let's go all the way. Let's not half ass this. Let's not. You know, and, and Ray was all for it. So that, like I said, my for me, my one of my favorite scenes, because I just crack up every time I watch it is like when he go, lays into, his, you know, to into Jen in Korean. Oh. And, yes. Yes. And then, and then his response is like, 
when did you learn to speak Korean? You know, it's like, because CS yeah. kills it, you know, it delivers yeah. it just so, you know, and it was just like, and Ray was so excited to be able to just like speak Korean, you know, yeah. and on, on yeah. in, in television. Again, he is like, there's nobody like uh, Ray on, on television as far as like, as far as a lead action one hour drama asian american star there's you know there's yeah. there's there's you know there's other shows that have asian americans as a part of ensemble cast but he is the star of quantum leap right and yeah. and that's the fact that that is so rare is a whole other issue that we can get into and talk about but of so we, but we but ben and i did not want to squander this opportunity and we didn't want to let ray down and none of us wanted to let ray down this was so it was very easy to sort of like make these decisions and just sort of like talk to him about it and get his input and you know he he's a sneakerhead so you know <laughs> you know putting putting those shoes in there uh you know putting those jordans in there that was that was important we had to, That's awesome. we had to, you know, we had to make sure that hey, if you're gonna do this, it could be like we got to have some Jordans up in this thing, <laughs> LA gear, right? <laughs> so yeah. just, like, like Ben pointed out the other day, it was like, and I didn't think about it. It was like, yeah, I haven't seen LA gear, and I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> it's like, it's like, <laughs> and so when we, so when they put the the shoe store together and we walk in there, we're like, oh, this is so cool. Yeah, yeah uh ben anything to add to that about you know the the collaborative you know efforts with ray on the episode i mean it's just the the level of authenticity that his his presence was able to sort of bring to this episode um you know uh i, I believe he and cs are, are golf buddies so yeah. like so, <laughs> yeah right, right so like so, so, yeah. so that was that was so they you know they already have a relationship and a shorthand with one another as as, as people that you know it just it, it the, the chemistry with him on, on screen was fantastic and like yeah. and again like they it, it coming to it from the perspective of an outsider I have to work twice as hard to make sure I do it right and to to have a partner like Ray making sure that everything was done right uh, I, I'm grateful for yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it was like there was one night, maybe it was the last night that uh, we were shooting um, in the in the in the in the shoe store. We all were like me, Ray, CS, uh, Annalise, it was Annalisa, and 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 uh, Danny, Danny Kang, play Sunny. Mm -hmm. We all went to Korean barbecue after because we were like, we gotta go do this. We gotta we gotta <laughs> we gotta go into Korea town and get some Korean barbecue. <laughs> and, yeah. and uh yeah and so it was you know the, to sort of like just bring it home <laughs> like let's let's yeah. go to korea town and do that you know so the, again it was like having again that level of enthusiasm and part of it of just him being able to step into that so you know seamlessly um it was it was it's, you know it's, it's a, something that I'll, I'll i'll be forever appreciative of yeah, it sounds like a very a unique and special experience, to be sure. Um, the last thing that I wanted to, to mention is that, you know, just from a very personal perspective, being in recovery myself and, and, and you know, dealing with the, the beast of alcoholism, you know, not only for myself, but it's just kind of a hallmark of the transgenerational trauma that I know that I've experienced and seeing the way that it's handled in this episode, in particular with Magic's difficulties dealing with this, those situations and being, you know, present in, in obviously very triggering and, and trauma inducing situations for himself. Um, two scenes really landed on me, especially upon rewatch, not that they didn't know the first time I watched it, but quite frankly, rewatching the episode, two things that really hit were the scene where he tells Ben that he's an alcoholic and it hit for two reasons because being able to have the courage to admit that and say that to someone that you're close to, and especially someone who looks up to you, you know, that you, that you look at as, as, as a son, um, it, it, that, that certainly hit me. But the other thing that really hit was Ben's reaction to it and the way that he owns a part of that, whether or not he should or not, who knows? And that's, that's certainly up for debate, but he does. And it's beautiful. I mean, Ray, I, I, I've sung Ray's praises 
all season long, especially. I mean, the work that he's doing is absolutely phenomenal. Deserves all the recognition in the world because he doesn't say a damn word. He just there's this intake, you know, he, he breathes in and you just see his face. Like, it's just like he he t- he took this on like there's like this this thing in the room and he breathes it in because he has to take the weight of that on. And then he verbalizes it a little bit later and apologizes for it. Um, th- that scene and the decision to, you know, have magic actually be an alcoholic. Um, can you talk about that, the decision behind that? And if there was any question whatsoever about like, maybe we shouldn't do this or, or can we do this, that sort of thing, Ben? No, I mean, that was a, you know, a room decision early uh, in the break of the season that we knew we were going to, we were going to live in the fallout of, of our failure. And how is that going to ripple through differently to each of our characters? Um, it wasn't like, it, and it wasn't like, oh, we put all these, here are these traumas we can put on the table and who gets which trauma? It wasn't, it wasn't anything like that. It just, it, 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 it came about organically in conversation that this is what we want. We think this, this would be a struggle that would be, you know, interesting to what, you know, what if magic went through this, right? We posed ourselves that question and again, the, the serendipity of where our episodes fall in the season, we found ourselves in a spot where we could finally, you know, we could, we could actually dramatize and tell that story in a way that wasn't just, you know, a throwaway line that, you know, we never were going to, you know, follow up on. Um, It was, uh, I think, um, you know, Ben, Ben's reaction to it and, and his, his taking it on himself, as you said, I think, again, serendipity of, of timing is that, in the wake of the dissolution of his partnership with Addison, recognizing it, it, it goes back to my choice to leap to save her life. And this, I'm just as culpable for, for what magic has become as anything else that's, that's happened in my life, right? Yeah. To my surrogate father figure is struggling now because he couldn't save me. Right. And it it does. It lands very hard on 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 Ben Song. And and, I mean, Ray, you know, played it beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. It's again, I think it's a remarkable moment. And and I think it's it's a testament to the fact that all of these things that have happened, you know, none of this was a gimmick. None of this was like, oh, you know what? Let's just have three years pass. And I mean, all of it is being examined. And I think in the course of this episode in particular, you know, we see Ben ian and magic specifically i think reckoning with choices that have been made in the wake of everything that they've learned since the end of season one uh, or the intervening you know three years for the project crew um the 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 last thing i'll mention um is that that final scene with magic where he walks into the elevator and he you know, calls beth and cancels the dinner plans because he says he needs help he wants to go to a meeting and you know he wants her to be there um uh, <clears throat> it I'm, I'm it's making me emotional right now um it was uh it was a, such a lovely moment because i think one of the things that it speaks to and we've talked a little bit about this with other factors in the course of the episode the the work never really stops and the 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 trauma and the damage never really goes away that we have to continue reckoning with it, but there are creative, positive coping mechanisms out there. And so much of the time they really depend on the people that we surround ourselves with and and the, and the connections we make with other human beings. Um, obviously it was an important scene to me. It, 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 it you know, made a, made a mark for me. Um, and Ernie is, is phenomenal in that moment. Um, Derek, can you talk a little bit about choosing to kind of end the episode in that fashion with, with Ernie and with, you know, with that moment calling Beth and asking for help? Yeah, that came about in the, in the room and we were talking again because we want to make sure that we get this right. Especially this is, this is such a, a delicate subject, such a personal subject 
for a lot of people, including yourself, that we wanted to make sure that we're not doing a disservice. Um, and, and, you know, it was, but also it was important to show that him coming, having just experienced this story with, with Ben and Ben saying the things that he said to him, that the impact, like you said, of like having the right people in your life, the good people in your life. And so it's not just all, you know, the QL family, but it's also Beth. And by him reaching out to Beth in that way, knowing that this is the person that pulled him back from the brink. Um, and, you know, and, and asking for that help, because it's not easy to ask for that help, especially on the night of their anniversary, right? The whole plan <laughs> of having the dinner and having, you know, it was supposed to be a moment for the both of them and for him to make this call to ask, hey, I need your help from, you know, I need your help. It's like, that's a, that's a big step. That's a, you know, that's not, you, you don't take that, that lightly. So we wanted to make sure that we're not going to do that scene lightly, as far as, you know, that there's, there's a lot of importance in that again, of like, just what it comes down to, you know, it get, when it, whenever Ben and I do try to write and, and just in general, like just work on the show is just like, you have to be respectful. You have to be respectful of what you're doing because you never know who you're going to impact. You never know who is going to affect and who, who can relate and who has might have that story and who might be struggling and seeing. And then, you know, it's like, I don't want to be like the thing, like this is the episode that helped somebody reach out, but this is the beauty of being able to work in this medium and work, you know, as, 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 and tell stories is sometimes you do get stories that come back where people saying like, you know what, I was thinking of doing something else, but then I saw that episode and it helped me make a decision. And, yeah. and 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 reach out and do this stuff. So you know the same thing. We, we you know it's like it's all about family, right? It's like, but it really is in that way of like where the you said it best of like you know having the right people in your life and then the impact that could have and the ripple effects that can cause. And so having Ben in his life and it's you know allows magic to make that phone call. Allows because it's like. Would he have made that phone call without? I don't know. Would he? Would he? Would he have? If Ben, if Beth would have never confronted him about the the bottle or anything that, and he was not a QL, and they just would have went about their day, how would that you know affect them? And so it's all it's all the connections of the, the relationships, and we want to make sure that we always are just trying to push that forward and 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 make sure that that continues to exist in that way, because again, that's reflective of the show itself that you want to care about these moments. Well, there's definitely power in, in, in having a, you know, character like magic, this Vietnam veteran, this admiral, an actor like Ernie Hudson mm -hmm. be so vulnerable and, 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 and yeah. be able to ask for, for help and, and say like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm hurting right now. I need help. Um, ben. Yeah. I mean, everything Derek said, I mean, I, it's being respectful, treating the subject matter. This is this, this it's funny and when we finally got to watch the episode right we wrote it we put it on paper we shot it it wasn't until i actually sat down to watch the episode that i realized just how much we have in these 42 minutes mm -hmm. and how many of those things are you know potentially sensitive issues that that could that that affect people in in deep meaningful ways and just the level of, of, of pride I feel that everybody involved in the process of making this episode put into crafting something that at the end of the day, yes, it's a piece of entertainment, but hopefully maybe it'll mean something to someone and we can, you know, know that, that, that our work led to something like that is, is it's incredibly gratifying. Yeah, it's a. Te I mean, it's a test. One, of, I think, one of the, the the many, quite frankly, compliments I can give. But one of the highest compliments I can probably give is that, yeah, this episode does not buckle under the weight of all of the stuff that it's filled with, which is is is, is just a testament to, I think, you know, not only your writing, but as we've spoken about before, just that collaborative process and and the, and the work that everybody was able to put into the episode. Um, I will say in closing that I appreciated the nod to paging Dr. Song that you guys were able to put in the episode. <laughs> mentioning that he, that he had experience in a hospital. That was, that was <laughs> I dug that. Uh, but uh, uh, 
Guys, it's always such a pleasure. I really, really, really appreciate you coming back on the show and talking about the episode. Uh, I could keep going, obviously, but out of respect for your time and the listeners' time, uh, I will, I will, I will bring us to. Well, a we're close. not doing a three-hour podcast. That's what I, I was. <laughs> busted, David. I'm ready. Monday. <laughs> I mean... What else am I going to do? <laughs> uh well i appreciate that i uh, you know oddly enough i'm the one that has something to do this time around so who uh, thought that? Um, I but no I, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but no i i really I really, really appreciate it oh yeah no no i yeah now i'm the one i'm, I'm big timing you know um no i i i just really appreciate it it's always such a pleasure and 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 i really i look forward to being able to do it again um and i i hope people enjoy the episode and i hope that that you know even maybe more than enjoying it that it means something to them because i think that it's it is a meaningful episode in a lot of ways and learning about some of the stuff uh you know and, and one of the things i'll take with me is learning that ray you know kind of pitch this episode in a way it, 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 it does give me a whole new appreciation for an episode that I already appreciated a great deal. So um, thank you both so much, Ben. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sam. Thank you for having us. And, and, and thank you for sharing a little bit of your story uh, yeah. that we didn't know about. So, you know, we, we appreciate you feeling comfortable to do that with us. Absolutely. No, my pleasure, Derek. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. No, no, no. Thank you. Um, it's, you know, always fun. And uh, yeah, it's a, I, 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 you know, if anything, I think we've, we've had a, lot, a lot of stuff that we've written, you know, we're always wondering if people like the stuff that we've written, but I think this time around, regardless if people like it or not, I'm very proud of what we've written. I'm very proud of what, you know, what we were able to create. And, and that's, you know, saying a lot there for, for myself. <laughs> it's like, cause <laughs> we don't necessarily praise our own, own shit. It's just like that. <laughs> <laughs> we really don't. We all yeah. like, especially Ben. They were like, mm, no, nah, let's let's not let's not talk about that. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and it's, even though it's good, it's I'm, like this is what I deal with. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I, I mean, listen, I, I'm 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 living with maybe we didn't fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> So you know, and sometimes that's, that's, that's really all we can ask for. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's uh, like when Ben when Ben says we don't be preaching, you know, we didn't even be preaching the episode, but while we're writing it, I'm very preachy. I'm like, I have a dream that we turn in a good draft that Martin and Dean will appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I appreciate you, by the way, saying Martin and Dean. Both of you did that because somebody at one oh. point said Dean and Martin, and it really fucked me up for a second. I was like, what, what are we talking about? Do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank and you, then gentlemen. shout out to really uh, the other unsung it. hero yes. I forgot to mention was Chris Grismer, our producing director, yeah. mm. who's been, who, who was behind the, you know, behind the battle lines, uh, holding it all together while we were, you know, while we were walking the picket lines, because they, they were still shooting up until, you know, we got uh, episode eight, you know, done. And right. then they didn't have any more scripts <laughs> like at that point, but they kept going and the crew again, you know, going back to the, 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 the resiliency and just like uh, the dogged determination of the crew finishing, you know, over 200 days. Cause we, we rolled right, like I said, rolled right into season two. And so yeah. it's, you know, that's, that's the thing. Everybody again, firing on all cylinders of really knowing what this show is and how the show works. And I think that's, like I said, reflective in what you're saying, what you're seeing now on screen. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that collaborative effort, I think has felt week in and week out and just the, 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 you know, the overall production values of the show. And it, it does, sometimes it feels like, you know, and it, I, I, I've said this before, it's not a show that I felt like needed to have a refresh, but it just feels like everything is refreshed and, 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 and things have just been stepped up this season and, and you can see it, you can hear it. Um, you can feel it. And, uh, I, 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 for one, you know, I loved last season, but this season has, has just been such a joy in so many ways. And I feel like I have, uh, I have gotten more emotional <laughs> this season with the ride that you all have taken us on than uh, I did last season. So, um, okay. so thank you. <laughs> I'll keep watching. I really appreciate it. <laughs> you think Absolutely. you think you're going through something now? Keep watching. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, gentlemen, so very much. I appreciate it, and uh, you guys take care. And I hope to have you back on again sometime in the in the near future. Love thank you, back. and thank you, everyone for listening. <laughs>